Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to UB's fourth annual three-minute thesis competition. My name is Graham Hamill, and I'm Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Graduate School. I would like to welcome you to the three-minute thesis competition, a campus-wide competition that asks advanced doctoral students to present their research to a panel of non-specialists in just three minutes. This event is co-sponsored by the Graduate School and Blackstone Launchpad, powered by Techstars. Thanks to Hadar Borden, Andrea Kraft, and Neil Patel from Blackstone Launchpad, and to Sandy Flash, Sue Adenolfi, Brittany Iannucci, and Ashley Kennan Zelasco from the Graduate School for coordinating this event for UB. And a special thanks to all the graduate students who have participated. There's been a remarkably positive response to this event from students and faculty who recognize the importance of doctoral education to the research mission of the university. The three-minute thesis competition was founded by the University at Queensland in Australia in 2008. The competition is now being held in over 900 uni at, at, at over 900 universities across more than 85 countries. And the competition itself really has two main goals. The first is to share, recognize, and celebrate the excellent research undertaken by doctoral students. And the second goal is to encourage doctoral students to sharpen their ability to communicate their research both concisely and effectively. At UB, we all understand the importance of advanced research, which is central to our mission. However, communicating that importance can be a real challenge. Most doctoral students spend their days in labs and libraries talking with other academics. It can be difficult to explain the value of our research projects, let alone in a concise way. Yet, if research is going to have an impact on the broader world, it must be communicated. The three-minute thesis competition aims to do exactly that. To that end, preparation for this year's 3MT competition began in the fall 2019 with workshops offered by the Graduate School and Blackstone Launchpad focused on the skills of communicating research. All graduate students at UB are invited um, to participate in the workshops to learn these essential skills. Students interested in participating in the competition presented their three-minute pitches in a preliminary round, which was held on the north, south, and downtown campuses. Today's finalists were selected for today's competition from the preliminary round. In preparation, each finalist received individual coaching from a Blackstone Launchpad Venture Coach. 30 students entered the, prelim the preliminary round from all fields of study, broadly speaking, STEM, social sciences, education, arts, and the humanities. The finalists today represent the very best of that group. And of course, since this is a competition, there are prizes. The first prize is $1,000, um, second place prize is $750, and third place prize is $500. There's also a People's Choice Award, which goes to the best presentation as selected by the audience who is viewing this video. That award is for $250. I'd like to thank our sponsors, UB's Business and Entrepreneurial Partnerships for their support, which makes the cash prizes possible. So here's how the competition will work. Today's event is being recorded. It'll be posted on the Graduate School website. The video will be reviewed by judges who I'll introduce or talk about in just a few minutes. And, the, um, and, and people across campus and in fact across the world will have the opportunity to view the video so viewers can vote on the People's Choice Award. Given the unique circumstances we're in today, um, under normal, I, I, I am today the MC. Under normal circumstances, I would be introducing Teresa Blair, Senior Vice President of Administration and Legal Affairs for Athenex Incorporated, who herself volunteered to serve as our celebrity guest master of ceremonies. Like I said, I'm serving in that role, and I would very much like to thank Ms. Blair for her willingness to serve. So let me talk just a little bit about how the presentations will be evaluated. PhD students presenting their research today will be judged on their communication style in two ways. First, was the research communicated in language appropriate to a non-specialist audience? And second, was the one static slide allowed during each presentation clear and helpful in enhancing the presentation? In addition, presentations will be judged on comprehension. Did the presenters make the audience understand the research? Finally, presenters will be judged on how engaging they were. Did they leave you wanting to know more? 
So we're honored to have an esteemed panel of judges whose evaluations will determine our first, second, and third place winners. Our panel of judges is made up of community leaders from a range of industries, including the arts, communications, and finance. Our judges are experienced professionals who have mastered the skill of communicating their work to broad audiences and therefore recognize the development of this critical skill in graduate students and the potential global impact of doctoral research. Our judges are Eilish Kumbo, Senior Food Technologist from Rich Products, Darshun Jayun Singer, President and CEO, BizWin Strategies in Triad Healthcare Recruiting, Sujalta Yelamunchili, partner Hogston Russ, and Yane Saren, director Albright Knox Art Gallery. And I just want to express um, my gratitude and the gratitude of UB for our judges' willingness to participate in this event. So now on to the competition. Our finalists today represent the absolute finest at UB. I will introduce each finalist, and as I'm doing so, that person will come up on stage and prepare to present. I'll finish my introduction with the words, ready, set, pitch. The finalists may then take a moment to center themselves, and when they start speaking their first word, their slide will appear on the screen, and the three-minute timer will start. There are monitors on the center stage displaying the timer to both the presenter and the audience and the judges. So if we're ready, let me turn and get ready. I'll introduce the first presenter. Um, the first presenter is Syed Ahmed Sanjidi. Please come up. Who is in the Department of Civil, Structural, and Environmental Engineering. And the, 3M, um, uh, the 3MT presentation title is Artificially Intelligent Systems for rapid post-earthquake inspections. Ready, set, pitch. Earthquakes are terrible things. In my home country, Iran, in a city with 90,000 residents, more than two-thirds of the population lost their lives after a massive earthquake. Unfortunately, human casualties are just the tip of the iceberg. After earthquakes, most buildings and bridges cannot be used before they are properly inspected. Therefore, the economic and social consequences could be very severe and potentially escalate beyond the seismic zone. A recent report showed that an earthquake in California, which supplies 30% of the food in the whole United States, could cost over $200 billion. Just imagine the consequence of shutting down this interchange for a few days. It's going to be bad. We need to quickly know if our civil infrastructures are safe so people can get back to their normal lives as soon as possible. Having said that, information on structural safety is crucial not to just rescue people, but also to minimize these economic losses. Unfortunately, human inspections are not a good option. They require a lot of time and money. And even if these resources are available, are you willing to go inside a building or under a bridge like this that may collapse any minute? I know I'm not, and that's the reason my research at UB is focused on developing systems that can predict damage in real time. Like a human heart monitor, structural vibrations tell us a lot about the condition of our buildings. With the help of structural dynamics and artificial intelligence, we are trying to translate these vibrations into damage in just a few seconds. My research is dedicated to making damage detectors that can work reliably even in very noisy environments. Therefore, our artificial neural networks are trained and tested for thousands of earthquake simulations so they can predict various types of damage. As a result, by placing a few accelerometers here and there on a bridge or a building, you can quickly predict not only the locations of damage, but also their severities. Sadly, History and science have taught us that earthquakes are inevitable, but disasters don't have to be. With the help of my research, we are trying to train robot doctors for our cities. Then they are giving us valuable information so we can take proper actions immediately after the earthquakes. 
The efforts of me and my colleagues will take us several steps closer to a faster recovery and building more resilient communities against these natural disasters. Thank you so much, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you, Syed. The second presenter is Emily Sakara, who's a student in the Department of Chemistry. Emily's 3MT presentation title is More Than a Gut Feeling, Finding a Biomarker for Autism and Spectrum Disorder. And one of the things that um, about Emily that I'll just share with you is that not only is she um, an expert in chemistry, but she's also a lover of wine and goes to wine tastings quite often and apparently has also taste, taken wine tasting classes. So um, that's, that's really terrific. Um, so if you're ready, um, ready, set, pitch. I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you are a new parent. You're excited, you're nervous, and a little bit sleep deprived. As you watch your child grow, you notice that they're not really looking you in the eye, they're not babbling, but maybe you're just overreacting. As time goes on though, they're not playing with the other children and they're not talking. All right, it's time to see a doctor. And what, after what feels like countless doctor's appointments, they finally come back and tell you, all right, your child probably has autism. Probably? <laughs> what do you mean, probably? Shouldn't you be giving me a definitive answer? Unfortunately, that's the reality that those with autism spectrum disorders currently have to face, a probably. We're just missing one more puzzle piece. Everyone deserves a definitive diagnosis, and not just a probably, yet despite its increasing incidence from 1 in 150 to 1 in 59 in just a decade, we still have no answer. But that's where I come in. I'm looking for a way to diagnose autism in non-invasive samples like urine and feces. And I found something. It's what causes your feces to be brown and your urine to be yellow. Its name? Sturcobillin, and you can see it right in our puzzle pieces to the left. And it makes some sense too. Sturcobillin is made in our guts, and the guts and the bacteria in them are different in those with autism than they are in healthy controls. So where are we at now? I've been doing some testing in animal models. In the first, we used an animal model using a mouse with Timothy syndrome, which when in humans, over 80% of those who live long enough tend to develop ASD. And what we found was astonishing. In just 14 pairs of mice, we saw a depletion of 48% in the autistic mice. And this is with a significance to us that could be used in the clinic. But it wasn't enough for me just yet. So we've moved into a larger model, this time rats. But Instead of Timothy syndrome, they have Fragile X. So Fragile X is the one and only genetic cause we really know for autism at the moment. And currently, with 13 pairs of mice, we are seeing a depletion of stercobilin of 38%, but we're not quite ready for the clinic yet. For now, that is. So in the last few months of my PhD, that's what I'm planning to do. I'm planning to bring diagnosis to a clinical trial. As I said, everyone deserves a definitive diagnosis, and it's time we diagnose autism. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Our third presenter is Oladapo Uganbodide, who is a student in mechanical and aerospace engineering. The title of his 3MT presentation is Energy Efficient Drones, Lessons from Nature. Oladapo is, as you might expect from someone in mechanical and aerospace engineering, a fan of airplanes and motoring shows like Grand Tour, but he's also a fan of studying mythology, which points to his wide interest, I think. So, ready, set, pitch. Humans. Some say we are the pinnacle of evolution, the perfect animal. But is this assertion really true? If this assertion were true, 
the old study of bio-inspired design wouldn't exist. Bio-inspired design has been applied in diverse fields, from design of cars to design of aircrafts, to how we dress, to even how we build our houses. Today, I'm here to talk about bio-inspired design in drones. Yes, drones. A couple of years ago, mentioning the word drone painted an image of military personnel at the Pentagon controlling aircrafts remotely. Today, drones have become ubiquitous. They've been used in simple scenarios like taking a selfie to complex scenarios like looking for a missing child in the wilderness. In all of this scenario, there is a common need to fly longer or cover more distance, or even do both. This is where my research comes in. Fortunately, Nature has shown that there is a better approach to flying than what is currently the norm. This approach is known as periodic locomotion. An example of a bird that exhibits this behavior is the albatross. The albatross is a large migratory bird that covers over 100,000 miles in flight annually. This is way more than what our cars cover in six years, not to talk about the gas cost. Periodic locomotion in simple terms means that you use energy in a short amount of time to gain speed or night and then glide until a lower limit in speed or night is reached before flapping again. This is the albatross's evolutionary response to energy savings. Can this be applied to drones? The answer is yes. In my research, my aim is to use this concept to look for more energy efficient ways for drones to fly. Results for my research shows that using this method gives about 23% to 50% improvement over our current methods of flying. What is the real world application of all of this, you may ask? I'm glad you asked. Less energy use is greener and will lead to millions of dollars in savings as the current economic impact of drones in the US is about $13 billion and it's projected to grow to $83 billion in the next couple of years. Apart from the economic importance, Think about delivering medications and other essential health care services to the 3.4 billion people in rural areas. And our drones that have learned to fly efficiently from nature can fly to these areas, delivering all these supplies, saving the lives of both the old and the young. Thank you. Our next presenter is Joel Carota. Um, she's a, a PhD student in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, and the title of her 3MT presentation is The Venezuelan Community of Pescara, Italy, a Sociolinguistic Analysis of Spanish in Contact with Italian. And one thing I would, I, I'll just share about you is that not only is Joelle, Joelle uh, um, uh, an expert in Romance languages, but she's also learning American Sign Language. So, ready, set, pitch. Buenas tardes a todos. Voy a empezar mi presentación en español. Si están de acuerdo, si? As you might have noticed, yes, that was Spanish. And it's actually very common for buying multilinguals like myself to use all languages available in their linguistic repertoire and to switch from one language to another in their daily interactions like I just did. In my dissertation project, I seek to shed some light on how the bilingual members of the Italo-Venezuelan community of Pescara, my hometown in Italy, use linguistic variation to create, shape, and portray their social persona. This is actually the first quantitative study that wants to understand how um, linguistic variation and manipulation of Spanish and Italian affects project, um, processes such as language maintenance and or language loss in a foreign context. Let us take as an example this set of two identical words, example number two, that translate as Easter in English. They would be pronounced in two different ways. In Italian, Pasqua, and in Venezuelan Spanish, Pasqua. Thereby, the speaker is left with two different options. The speaker will choose one of the two options depending on the message they want to convey to their audience. And we actually really want to know what that message is, as well as what is the answer that the speaker has for questions such as, 
Are Italo-Venezuelans integrated into the Italian community? What do they think of the local school system? How are they approaching local uh, lifestyle and culture and language? You see, knowing the answer to these questions is very important for us so that we can first validate the very existence of this community and also we can help them in integrating successfully in the new community. By observing and studying natural language production, we want to create comprehensive linguistic and educational policies that could be implemented both at a national and local level and that take into account the linguistic diversity that has existed in the Italian school system for quite some time now. Also, I would like to create Spanish as a heritage language programs and Italian as a second language classes that target specifically these communities so that the younger generation do not lose their heritage language and culture. Think how much better things could be if these immigrant communities felt compelled to enhance the environment in which they lived. But we cannot help them doing so without first getting to know them. And this is what motivates my research. Thank you very much. The next presenter is Farshad Genayi, who's a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and the title of his presentation is Energy Awareness. Not only is, does he have a um, third degree black belt, which is very impressive, but um, there's a sort of coincidence that he's been teaching at UB for six years and also has had a small pet snail for six years. I don't know if there's a connection there, but at least it's, it's very interesting. So if you're ready, set, pitch. How often does your phone run out of battery? Have you thought whether your devices run as efficiently as they can? And finally, are you interested in extending the runtime of your phones or drones? Well, I have good news for you. My research can help your mobile devices run more efficiently. We live in a world surrounded by electronic devices, and we use them every single day. Many of them rely on a battery, and they have one thing in common. Their energy is limited. Some of them may run for a few hours before they run out, such as your phones or laptops, and some of them may only work for less than an hour. And for the most part, it's not even easy, or in cases possible, to charge them quickly and conveniently. So we, the developers, and programmers should be very, very careful how to design and program these devices so they use their limited energy efficiently. My dissertation introduces energy awareness in battery-powered mobile devices. I study mobile systems, specifically phones and drones, and, and introduce ways so that we can make them more energy efficient. I achieve this in three steps. Step one, I introduce software changes that allow the system to track its energy use. Think of your phones and applications. Your system needs to know how much energy is used by each application so that it can report it correctly and close them if needed. And it should know this accurately. My research helps achieve this by modifications in the underlying operating system. Step two, I use specialized hardware to measure the actual energy consumption of a uh, device so that we can use it for better planning. Think of a drone covering an area looking for an object or a person. The trajectory that you plan for this flight can hugely impact its energy and runtime. And we have shown that we can improve this by 15 to 20 percent. Step three, I introduce energy awareness to the next level. I let the device decide by itself and I show how task-specific energy awareness can lead to more utilization and efficiency so that the device at runtime can make, its this, um, make the most energy efficient decision. This is what we call energy awareness, where we study what impacts the energy of battery powered systems and use this information for better modeling, planning, and decision making. My dissertation can help the designers, developers, and programmers program our devices such that they run more efficiently and for longer periods of time. Thank you. Our sixth presenter is Poonam Chaudhry.
from the Department of Medicine. And the title of her presentation is Advanced Imaging for Pre-Symptomatic Diagnosis of Crab Disease. Not only is she an expert in medical sciences, but she also has an interest in fashion design and can speak, read, and write three languages fluently, which is quite impressive. So, you ready? Set, pitch. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me start with an assumption that if you are from Buffalo and an avid football follower, you might have heard of Crabbe disease. Have you? Well, if you haven't, let me inform you about it. Crabbe is a rare neurological disorder which becomes fatal within two to five years of life. And being genetic in nature, it is currently impossible to predict and prevent it from happening. Now, if you ask me about the two most important factors in treating a disease, my answer would be the accuracy of the diagnosis and its timely treatment. Shown on the left-hand side is the newborn screening, a process of testing blood samples for newborns for crab A disease. But there's a, there are some issues with this process. For one, there's 25% chance of detecting false positives or false negatives, meaning crab A disease can either go undetected or it can be falsely diagnosed. Second, not being a federally mandated procedure it is only applicable in just few states, and New York is actually one of them. So when a child gets diagnosed or misdiagnosed with Crabbe, that child has to go through an excruciating stem cell therapy, which, is, which comes with heavy side effects. Nobody, nobody likes to be treated for what they don't have, especially infants. The physical and emotional toll on the child and the parents is just unimaginable. My research shows that by using advanced imaging technology of PET and MRI, it is indeed possible to detect pre-symptomatic biomarkers of crab A disease in 15 days old mice. And by the word pre-symptomatic, I mean the time before the physical and clinical symptoms appear, which is a very crucial period to nip the disease in the bud. In future, we will translate this animal study in humans. And if we are successful, then we will be in a better position to recommend advanced imaging along with newborn screening across all medical centers in the country. To conclude, for those of you who are still wondering about the connection between football and crab A I mentioned in the beginning, for them, uh, my suggestion is to go home and do some research about it. And here's a hint. The Buffalo Bills quarterback who took Buffalo to Super Bowl four years in a row. Thank you. The seventh presenter for today is Christopher Spence. Christopher is in the Educational Leadership and Policy Department in the Graduate School of education and the title of his 3MT presentation is the impact of high stakes testing. One of the things that Christopher notes about himself is that his favorite sports team is UB's basketball team. So um, go Bulls and ready, set, pitch. Hello. If you look at the screen, you see two graduates from two varying institutions. Can you tell me the differences between these two graduates? You can't, there aren't any noticeable differences. Better yet, I ask, can you tell me the differences between a student that attended, uh, that received the grade A at a nationally ranked high school versus one that received the same grade of A at one of the lowest performing schools in the nation? You can't. And this is why I argue for the necessity of high stakes testing. Because high stakes testing is essential because it acts as a form of quality control within our educational system. Could you imagine having a surgeon who went to one school and a surgeon who went to another who did not have to take in some or, or did not receive an external barometer to assess the content knowledge that they have or their skills? That would be unconscionable. Well, the same thing is true in our schools. Research tells us that when you look at children of color and women, teachers hold varying expectations. 
We tend, to, we tend as a profession to hold high expectations for students of the majority, particularly Caucasian students. Meaning that the children of color, the most disadvantaged or likely to be disadvantaged by a teacher with low expectations within the system. What I found in my research is that high stakes testing, however, causes teachers to align their expectations with that of the state, thus raising their expectations. So in order to effectively and efficiently assess what students are learning, what students are capable of doing, we must have an external barometer. Think about it like this. How do you discern, again, who to admit to a school? How do you discern who to hire? You cannot do so without having that external barometer to assess what that student or person knows. Too often in our education system, we see that schools come to mean different things. Elite institutions are very different from low-performing institutions. We've tried to figure out how our schools are stratified, and some people say poverty, some people say that it's policies. But what I've found in my research is that one particular aspect that has not been researched is teachers' expectations as it relates to high-stakes testing. High-stakes testing and the pressure to perform according to the state's will rises teachers' expectations of students, irrespective of their gender or race. So in order to make sure that we are producing a product in our educational system that is of sound reason in mind and has the skills that are deemed necessary for college and career readiness, we must have an external barometer to assess students so that we can compare them and rate their skills. And that's why I argue that high stakes testing is essential because it is a part of quality control. Thank you. Our eighth presenter today is Xiao Xiao Chang, who's a PhD student in the Department of Oral Biology in the School of Dental Medicine. The title of her presentation is Preventing Bone Loss with Fewer Side Effects. And one of the things that Xiao Xiao says about herself is that for fun, she likes hiking, salsa dancing, and weightlifting. It's very impressive. So if you're ready, set, pitch. It's hard to notice but our bones are changing all the time. While I'm talking, my body is breaking down old bone and building up new bone continuously. These two processes are conducted by bone destroying cells and bone building cells. Like our stomachs produce stomach acid to digest food, bone destroyers produce enzyme K to digest the bone. In healthy adults, Bone mass is stable because bone destroyers and bone builders are constantly talking to each other by sending and receiving signals. However, when people age, bone destroyers may go out of control, as you can see on the screen. They produce too much enzyme K, which are like bombs blowing up healthy bone. This is how osteoporosis occurs. Osteoporosis puts people at great risk for fractures. In the US, half of women and a quarter of men over 50 will experience an osteoporosis-related fracture. However, commonly used osteoporosis drugs are low efficiency because they aim at killing bone destroyers. Indeed, killing them can prevent bone loss, but it also disrupts their communication with bone builders. You can imagine, when bone destroyers keep dying, bone builders cannot get enough signals from them. As a result, less new bone is built. So how do we get rid of this terrible side effect? Instead of killing bone destroyers, what if we just disarm their bombs, enzyme K? Fortunately, a substance called heparin sulfate has been shown to bind to enzyme K and inhibit its activity. However, there are so many different kinds of heparin sulfate. My research is to identify which heparin sulfate interacts with enzyme K the best. To achieve this, we used a very cool technique called microarray. It allowed us to compare the binding affinity of enzyme K to 52 heparin sulfate in a single experiment. We have already identified a few candidates. Next, we will test them on mice. 
our ultimate goal is to invent a heparin sulfate-based drug that inhibits enzyme K and at the same time brings fewer side effects than traditional osteoporosis drugs. This research is novel because there's no drug targeting enzyme K so far. Hopefully, in the near future, there will be no osteoporosis anymore, and people can all have strong bones at old age. Thank you. Our ninth presenter is Saeed Hamed Gadsi. Saeed is a PhD student in the Department of Civil, Structural, and Environmental Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And the, um, the title of his presentation is Combined Sewer Overflow Prediction and Reduction. Uh, Saeed is clearly a major sports fan, plays sports, including soccer, volleyball, and tennis, is, and is a fan of um, of professional basketball, specifically this season, the Lakers. So, ready, set, pitch. My journey starts when rainfall happens. As you may know, rainwater is one of the most valuable resources on the Earth. However, this rainwater can act as a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's a main source of drinkable water, especially in arid areas like Africa. But it can overwhelm densely populated urban areas and have negative environmental consequences, such as urban flooding and combined sewer overflow. In my research, my focus is on this combined sewer overflow or CSOs problem. But what does that mean? Well, in cities like City of Buffalo, we have a combined sewer system, which means that when a rainfall happens, the runoff goes to the same pipelines where the sewage goes. So, as you probably can guess, when a rainstorm happens, this sewer system cannot handle all this mixed flow together. Therefore, a portion of that, instead of moving to the treatment plant, would be released to the water bodies like Lake Erie without any treatment. This untreated overflow, which contains many contaminants and can harm our local environment, is called CSOs. You should know that it is not only Buffalo. There are more than 700 cities in the entire United States are facing this problem. Millions, millions of fishes die every year and many beaches have been closed because of this issue. What if I tell you we can reduce this untreated overflow by up to 30 or even 40 percentage, which in a real case of Buffalo is more than 600 million gallons in a year. With my research, there is a way. The solution lies in using green infrastructures like green roofs and rain barrels. The concept is to capture the runoff at its source and infiltrate it to the ground before it goes to the sewer system and causes overflows. Although we have a solution of green infrastructure, there is not yet a, uh, a scientific way to determine the most effective type and placement of them. My research addresses this need by first developing an online monitoring tool and applying it for the city of Buffalo. Actually, we are collaborating with the Buffalo Sewer Authority for the potential implementation of this system. By using this tool, we can better understand the operation of the present sewer system, including the CSO events. Now, by knowing the current information of this untreated overflow, like its quality and quantity, we have to take action to mitigate it. To continue this research, I am developing a decision-making tool to find which type of green infrastructure we have to use, where we should locate them, and how many of them we should implement in the city to reduce the CSOs as much as we can. Lastly, the final goal of my research is to create a scientific way to support the decision makers like municipalities, to protect our aquatic environment, and also to improve the water quality that we all use for drinking, recreation, and living. Thank you so much. The tenth presenter for today is Zainab Farhat. She's a PhD student in epidemiology and environmental health in the School of Public Health and Health Professions. The title of her three MT presentation is Garlic's Role as an Antioxidant in Cancer. She enjoys going to concerts, cooking, baking, and doing puzzles. And she's both an avid fan of the New York Giants, which is okay, and iced coffee. So ready, set, pitch. Has anyone ever told you to eat garlic when you're sick or to use garlic to treat an infection? 
That's because garlic is a superfood that has been used since ancient times, but only recently we've begun to understand its wide range of health benefits. Garlic contains active compounds such as amino acids, vitamins, minerals, and over 33 sulfur compounds, which we can attribute those health benefits to. One such health benefit is its anti-cancer activity, which is the focus of my dissertation project. About one third of all cancer deaths in the United States could be avoided through appropriate dietary changes. And garlic can, is a cancer preventing food that has the ability to trap, block, and suppress cancer causing agents from leading to cancer. Garlic can act by capturing molecules known as free radicals that can roam around in the cell causing damage to our DNA and ultimately leading to cancer. Or it can act by directly killing cancer cells. These free radicals are angry molecules that can arise from sources such as cigarette use, alcohol use, air pollution exposure, stress, and drug use. If we have too many of these free radicals roaming around in the cell, this can lead to a dangerous phenomenon known as oxidative stress. This phenomenon can be counteracted by antioxidants like garlic because they can capture these free radicals and prevent them from causing DNA damage. The first part of my dissertation focuses on utilizing data from a large nationwide human study that collected information on people's garlic intake and supplement use and followed them for a period of time to see whether or not they got cancer or they died from cancer. What we found was that garlic supplement use for three or more years could prevent against any cancer development. However, the challenge with epidemiological or human studies is that the biologically active compounds in garlic could differ depending on the type of garlic form that's eaten or how it's prepared. So I set out to test the antioxidant and anti-cancer activity of several garlic forms, including fresh garlic, cooked garlic, garlic powder, and two commercially available garlic supplements. What we found that was that garlicin, which is a garlic supplement and contains predominantly garlic powder, had the ability to have high antioxidant activity and had the ability to kill cancer cells in lung cancer cell lines. The next part of my project was to administer this garlicin supplement to a group of healthy volunteers here at UB in a clinical trial and measure their antioxidant activity in the blood over a period of six weeks. Ultimately, we hope to translate these findings to cancer patients and promote garlic as a part of the regular healthy diet. Thank you. I have to admit that presentation made me a little hungry. Um, the next presenter is Ben Ryan, who's a PhD student in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics in the Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. The title of his 3MT presentation is Putting the Brakes on Autism, a New Molecular Strategy. Ben is clearly um, a, a person with wide-ranging interest. Not only did he enter his PhD program when he was 20 years old, but he also is the, he also served as the chief editor for a nonfiction novel that was published last year. And four years ago, he produced and released a complete hip hop album. So, ready, set, pitch. You may not find it surprising that one in every 59 children is diagnosed with autism, a disorder that affects the way the brain develops in ways that make socializing very challenging. But with so many children affected, you may be surprised to learn that there are no drug treatments which can improve the social symptoms of autism. We know that about 60% of all autism cases are caused by gene mutation, but it's still very unclear exactly why or how these mutations lead to autism. The goal of my research is to identify how these gene mutations change the brain. If we can answer this question, we can grow much closer to identifying treatment strategies which may be able to improve the social symptoms of autism. So let's talk about the brain. The brain is made of billions of cells called neurons, which, believe it or not, actually have conversations with each other. They do this by communicating at little junctions called synapses. An example of a synapse is shown on the left side of the screen. Now, this is all very complicated, so let's break it down. Think about the brain like a roadmap of a big city, and each of these synapses like an intersection with a traffic light. Just as traffic lights signal stop or go to control the flow of traffic, these synapses can send either positive or negative signals to control the flow of information across brain cells. Of course, red lights are very important for preventing car accidents and traffic buildup. Similarly, we have red lights in the brain called GABA synapses, 
and these are equally important for preventing brain activity from getting out of control. People who don't have autism have a healthy balance between red lights and green lights in the brain, but we often see that this balance is lost in patients with autism, and I wanted to get to, get to the bottom of what was causing that. So, I looked into the brains of mice carrying one of the most common gene mutations in autism, and I found that in a brain area which controls social interaction, they actually had less of these red lights, and as a result, these mice showed reduced social interactions. Just imagine if the part of your brain controlling your social interactions was like a city with no red lights. After investigating, I also found that a molecule called NPAS4 was also reduced, and this is important because in the brain, NPAS4 is responsible for building these red lights. By performing a surgical procedure, I was able to restore the level of NPAS4, and I found that this not only caused more red lights to be built, but more importantly, it made these mice significantly more social to the point where they were indistinguishable from normal mice. This research indicates that by targeting NPAS4 and building more red lights in the brain, we may have identified a new molecular strategy to put the brakes on autism. I'm very excited about this research, and I can't wait to take it to the next level. In fact, I'm now testing drugs in the lab which may be able to target NPAS4 and therefore serve as novel therapeutics for autism. I can't wait to complete this research here at UB. Thank you. Our final presenter for today is Nagashri Lakshmi Narayan. I'm sorry. Um, Nagashri Lakshmi Narayana. I apologize for that. Um, she's a student in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. The title of her presentation is Facial Expression Recognition, a Step Towards Emotionally Intelligent Technology. Um, besides being an avid hiker, she also is an avid game player when she's with friends. So, Ready, set, pitch. Do you know what your face can say about you? Depending on the situation, you're either smiling, frowning, or showing some other form of expression. Your face has a way of letting people know how you feel without using words. Here's an interesting story. Dr. Paul Eggman, a renowned social psychologist, found something unusual in a specific video of a patient. The patient was trying to convince her counselors that she no longer had suicidal instinct. Everything seemed believable until he went through the video one frame at a time. Through a series of hidden emotions, he found a small but very strong glimpse of distress that the patient was trying to hide. This wouldn't have been detected by a naked eye. This was the beginning of facial expression recognition. For humans to annotate this expression is an extremely time-consuming and a cumbersome task. Instead, we can use computers to augment the effort and make the processing faster. My PhD thesis uses artificial intelligence to help computers perceive emotions the way that humans naturally do. With the image as an input, my algorithm learns to predict minuscule muscle movements on face like an eyebrow rise or a lip corner puller, to name a few. Between the input and the output are a series of complex functional blocks that are inspired by human intelligence, paying more attention to the salient regions on face, like the region around eyes and mouth, that are defined on anatomical basis. Each of these functions model increasingly complex features starting from edges and blobs in images all the way to human perceivable forms like eyes and nose. With no explicit programming, my algorithms can automatically leverage human expertise and match their predictions. Further, they can be used in scenarios where such expertise is unavailable or expensive. In the past few decades, there's been a rapid shift in how we interact with technology from using computers merely for calculations to social computing. Therefore, now more than ever, there's a greater need for technology to be able to support human cognitive capabilities. Looking ahead, this could benefit many applications like automatically detecting symptoms of pain and depression in geriatric patients who are unable to verbalize their feelings or to detect and alert the automobile users to their emotional states. My PhD thesis is one step towards creating technology that can recognize and respond to human emotions effectively, 
thereby creating more meaningful human computer interactions. Thank you. I hope everybody here enjoyed the presentations as much as I did. It's always so impressive to hear the amazing research that is happening here at the university. I'd like to give a round, I'd like to ask everybody to give a round of applause to everyone who presented here today for all of the excellent performances that we saw. And this brings an end to the, this, um, this year's three-minute thesis competition. I can't wait to see who the winners are, and I'm glad I don't have to choose. <laughs>